from my perspective, what I need to provide investors with is optionality because uh, we all believe prices should be higher. But the big question is, when will that happen? And, and uh, investors sometimes get frustrated and tired with, you know, when will this come? When will this come? And uh, if you're going to invest in a mining company, you want to make sure that that mining company can perform throughout the precious metals price cycle. And uh, you can be uh, safe knowing that your investment is, uh, is, is profitable and it's a business that's viable in, in any price in the, at any price in the cycle. Today, we're going to get a unique perspective on the gold and silver market. We're joined by Jorge Ganoza. He's the CEO of Fortuna Silver Mines. They're a one billion market cap global intermediate gold and silver producer. Jorge's built the company up over the last 10 years. So he has a thing or two to say and think about the gold and silver price. His family has been in the mining uh, industry for generations. Jorge, welcome to Ron's Basement. Thank you, Ron. And just a, a minor correction there. It's been, uh, Fortuna's journey has been 18 years now. <laughs> oh, 18 years. Well, I've, I've only I've only been following for 10. So my my apologies. <laughs> seems like I've imagined sometimes that seems like only yesterday, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's impressive what you've done building the company from, I know, scratch with the help of some other investors uh, up to a point now where you have five operating mines that uh, practically span the globe. And uh, so I, I would think that over the last 18 years, uh, you've developed some observations on the precious metals markets. Would you, you know, tell us what you think now when you look at the silver price and gold price? You know, uh, I think as we were talking before, before we jumped into the interview, uh, the precious metals investors uh, are every so often put to the test, right? I think, uh, you know, I share the, the view that, uh, uh, you know, we should be seeing significantly higher prices. Uh, why? I mean, I, I'm not a, you know, macroeconomic analyst nor, nor anything like that. But uh, listen, you know, a decade ago, 12 years ago, we were selling uh, or, or gold and silver at prices that uh, were very similar to what we're seeing today. That's 12 years ago, right? Uh, we were selling price uh, or, or selling price for gold was averaging, what, $1,900, $1,950 back in 2011. Silver was hovering $30. Uh, today, silver is closer to 24 and, and, and gold, uh, you know, in the mid to low 1900s, right? So, uh, you know, I am of the view that if, if we, we, we still think of uh, gold uh, and silver uh, close to record highs on nominal terms, yes. But uh, if we adjust for inflation, uh, the prices of uh, or the precious metals are significantly lagging right? Uh, therefore, in our industry, in, in the mining industry, what we've seen is really um, margin destruction over the last uh, decade, right? So, you know, with all that I see out there with uh, uh, the difficult situation, the Fed change, uh, faces, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I I'm bullish on, 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 on higher prices. When will those materialize? That is the, the billion dollar question or, or $10 billion question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a billion dollars, the Fed has made, uh, it's, it's not much these days, right? Right. <laughs> uh, oh, come on. We, we, you know? Come on, Jorge, we thought you were going to give us the answer, you know, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I I try to focus more on the things I can manage from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, my cost, the type of assets we get involved with and, and things like that. Of course, we have a view on, on metals, 
we have to budget every year and we have to make assumptions on metal prices. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. uh, when we plan for the business, we try to be as conservative as we can on metal prices. Now, we might have personal views uh, on, 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 on the metal. And I think that's what we're talking about here. Uh, I, I share the view that, you know, uh, prices uh, have uh, fundamentals to be much higher. You know, why haven't they materialized? We can discuss about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I want to ask you another question uh, that I think you can offer a unique perspective to our viewers on as well. Your company now operates on three continents. Is that correct? Uh, North America, South America, Africa. Do you we operate mines yeah, in Africa and South America, North America, considering Mexico? Yes. Do you, when you're in, do you see a different um, appreciation and um, perspective on precious metals outside of the United States? I think in the United States, we're uh, somewhat discouraged into investing in precious metals. It's not a, um, a, a regular uh, subject matter uh, with most investment advisors. But when you're other places in the world, do you see a different level of appreciation for, for the precious metals? Yes, and 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 I mean I, I don't have to get uh, uh, too too imaginative to to see where that appetite is. Uh, if we look at uh, the public records for central bank purchases, we see that uh, central banks have been acquiring gold at record uh, pace uh, these past uh, months, right? So uh, absolutely. And even if you go to Europe, right? Uh, I was attending a, a, a European a precious metals focused uh, conference in, in Munich in, in uh, a few months ago. And uh, the amount of interest and, and appetite from the Europeans, uh, the Germans mainly, uh, was uh, very surprising to me. Right. Okay. Uh, now they have a war right next to to their 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 back door, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you know, I think gold in in is is serving its purpose for that crowd, right? And the central banks again, the central bank buying uh, has been uh, notably high and close to uh, not close record highs in terms of. of bank purchases over the last months. And I think, and you mentioned this earlier, geopolitically uh, in the world right now, we're experiencing uh, change, like at least in my lifetime, we I, I've, I've not seen. I, uh, I want to get one last comment, general comment on gold and silver, your commentary on this. When I look at the BRICS and we're hearing about the potential for a gold-backed currency, if you just take the ick out of BRICS, the I and the C, India and China combined, they have 2.8 billion people, which is like eight times the population of the United States. Uh, they also have growing economies. They also have growing middle class. And they have, I know in both of those countries, like a huge appetite for silver and gold. Um, it just feels like uh, uh, the, 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 the move in the world is more towards appreciation or a higher appreciation of silver and gold? Yes. And, and uh, again, we have to look at the signs on the wall, right? Uh, and I think the signs are there. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? This is not new. I've been in this industry long enough. I've seen a couple of cycles at least. And, uh, you know, including the one that I believe is brewing right now. And uh, I remember in 2000, 2001, uh, we were, you know, in the business, mining. And gold was trading at $300 per ounce. That wow. was miserable. That was miserable. Uh, and there was complete capitulation with respect to the industry, the sector. Uh, 
I mainstream media uh, lambasted uh, gold and, and the concept of this archaic uh, relic that gold was that it was um, better to to store water than than, than you know store gold uh, uh, to preserve value right and I remember all of this and uh, sure enough there came a moment when gold played its role and and we saw a tremendous bull run from the early 2000s up to the peak in 2011, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a tremendous uh, bull market for the sector in those days, right? Um, today, the floor from where we are uh, having these discussions is completely different, right? Again, we're trading at nominal highs, close to nominal highs. Um, so I believe that uh, you know there is uh, potential for significant appreciation, uh, and we are far from what I seen as as a as a really bad market, if you will. Right. right. Uh, but from from my perspective, what I need to provide investors with is optionality because uh, we all believe prices should be higher. But the big question is, when will that happen? And, and uh, investors sometimes get frustrated and tired with, you know, when will this come? When will this come? And uh, if you're going to invest in a mining company, you want to make sure that that mining company can perform throughout the precious metals price cycle. And uh, you can be uh, safe knowing that your investment is, uh, is, is profitable and it's a business that's viable in, in any price in the, at any price in the cycle. So when the theory does materialize, and we see this this run in the metal, the miners serve their purpose and provide that big leverage uh, to the investors. The, and that's why you invest in, a, in 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 mining equities, right? Looking for that leverage against if if you know, gold price uh, moves uh, 10, 15, 20% today, uh, miners, I think, are going to just go through the roof, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, you've you accomplished a lot in your 18 years. Um, I have a whole page of notes here uh, regarding, you know, past and now just even current uh, updates with the company. You just put out your production results for Q2, 93,400 uh, gold equivalent ounces. It feels like you have positioned the company uh, to benefit, right, from this potential future uh, price appreciation that we might get in gold. But even in the current environment, it feels like to me uh, that you've built a, um, a machine or an enterprise that, that even in today's prices can can do well. It's generating cash flow. I mean, are there any highlights that you want to want to touch on with what's going yes. on currently? Yes, and and the main one is that over the last uh, two years, we've been uh, working hard at seeding for tuna's growth for the next decade or two, and that is our Segala project or Segala mine. In the second quarter of this year, our, our new mine only contributed 4,000 ounces of gold to that figure that you just shared with the audience, 93,000. No? So uh, almost uh, you know, less than 5% of, of the ounces, 4% of the ounces uh, were contributed by our new mine, which in the third quarter should have a more, more stable a production and we should benefit from more weeks. Our first gold at this mine was poured on May 24th. So we had only what five weeks of ramp up and, and a bit of production in the pool. So the third quarter should be much stronger and the fourth one even even better, right? And and uh, so we've been investing over the last two years and it's only now that we're starting to harvest. Uh, and um, Seguela is a magnificent project with, you know, ticks all the boxes, low cost, meaningful production, long life of reserves, exciting exploration upside. So it's it's our flagship asset. 
and it's only coming to production now. The average all-in sustaining cost, these are figures that the World Gold Council produced just recently. In the first quarter, that's the latest figures we have from the World Gold Council for Q1 2023, the average, uh, the, the median gold production, the average gold production uh, came in at uh, almost $1,400 per ounce. No? Of yeah, all yeah. global gold mine supply, half of global mine supply you know, came at around uh, uh, $1,400. Uh, Seguela will produce gold that you know, we expect uh, once stable at around $1,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, I want to circle back to something you said earlier uh, when you were talking about the growth of the company and you said uh, the last two years you've been seeding the company for the next 10 years of growth and i and i had a little internal chuckle like oh you mean you know of course you watch the quarter by quarter numbers but that's the feeling i get about fortuna and i am a investor myself in the company is that you are making long-term decisions uh, and i feel like the acquisitions uh the rocks gold acquisition which brought you the seguela mine and the burkina faso operations that uh, and even this most recent announcement of the uh, acquisition of Chesser Resources in Senegal, that um, uh, that that you put a high uh, focus on quality. <laughs> that these are long term. Uh, you have a long term vision for the company uh, to continue to grow over the next eighteen years. Uh, is that is that a safe uh, assumption? You know, yes. All of the mines that over the last 18 years we have acquired and brought into production are still in production today. Hmm. Interesting. Right? Yeah. All of the mines that we acquired and brought into production are still in production today. I think in an ever depleting business, that's something, right? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> we make mistakes. Yes, we do. You know, every sure. time we make a judgment on an asset or whatever. We make mistakes, sometimes we do. We just try to make our mistakes, keep our mistakes small, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, all of our mines are in production and uh, all of them still offer exploration opportunities, potential. Uh, and uh, again, I think the future looks bright for us uh, and, and we see a lot of optionality in our portfolio. Right, mm -hmm. particularly in West Africa these days. I'm quite excited. You know, by no means we've given up on Latin America, no, by no means. We're still very committed, exploring, looking for opportunities. But uh, we open the field, we open the field for us going to West Africa. And uh, I, I see a lot of organic brownfields type opportunities in the portfolio. And, and a lot of greenfield opportunities as well. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. You always talk about the people, 5,500 employees at Fortuna. Is that part of your uh, of your secret? Because I wanna point, I wanna give you a big compliment. I think I've, I've done this a couple of times in the past, but it bears repeating. You know, a lot of silver mining companies that I follow very closely, over the last five, 10 years have attempted to move into gold mining, to diversify into gold mining. And almost all of them have been met with uh, severe challenges. I'll put it that way. And I don't wanna name any names of these other companies. You have delivered uh, time after time, uh, even when at one point, I know when the Rocks Gold acquisition was announced, there was some uh, skepticism in the market. Uh, but now we're seeing Seguela come to fruition. Um, I, I guess I want to ask you, you know, is there, is, is there a secret or is there, uh, what, what would you attribute you and, and, and with the help of the 5,500 employees you have there at Fortuna to your ability to consistently deliver? Yeah, the, the workforce is 5,500. A lot of those, oh. Uh, over half of that is is contractors, no, okay. that work at our mines, uh, which we view as our partners, right? We we but we manage a workforce, fifty five hundred, uh, and yeah, 
you know, absolutely people is everything. This is a complex, risky business. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a company like Fortuna today, I think, or, or, or first job is to, to develop the strategy. No, that's my responsibility. Uh, develop the strategy. And with that, then uh, make sure that we have the right people in the right place, right? And uh, I am, uh, what's my secret? What's the company secret? It's good people, you know, good committed people. Uh, you know, we, our business is complex, is uh, finding, funding, developing, permitting, uh, operating uh, mines in developing regions. So the geopolitical complexity of those regions uh, is, is, is high. So we not only need uh, good mining engineers, good explorers, but also people who can deliver in those complex uh, geopolitical environments, right? And um, I think well, that's what I do. I focus a lot of my time on that, on, on who should we be working with? And I'm fortunate to, to be, uh, uh, you know, together working with a, with a senior executive team of seasoned professionals, uh, committed, uh, who share the long-term view of the company and, and uh, contribute to the uh, strategy every day and the short-term delivery as well, right? So, uh, yeah, people is, is key. No? So today we have in our team Peruvians, Canadians, uh, U.S. Na nationals, uh, Australians, uh, Ivorians, uh, Burkinabis, <laughs> uh, Argentinians, Mexicans, hey, like, it's like, a diverse. Like the the it's United a, Nations, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a, but you know, it's so rich. It's a diverse team. Yeah. We've been working hard to expand the 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 presence of a uh, woman in the in the workforce. So today, our board has almost forty percent women uh, in the composition of the board. Uh, our management team. In, in the management team across the company, we have about 19, close to 20% female participation. And that also, you know, and, and, and it's not just female, it's female from different jurisdictions coming right. here through different walks of life, bringing all of that experience. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very rich, very diverse. Uh, and and that, that, that's something I'm particularly proud of, right? And, yeah. and, and uh, we try to keep it, keep everybody humble and, and, and uh, yeah. uh, try to keep politics to the very minimum. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah. So, yeah, all of that's working well. And, and, you know, keep your heads down and, uh, like you said, have a long term strategy. Uh, you always strike me as a, and this is our fifth or sixth conversation, as a very humble person. I also want to mention, you know, I interact with other people at the company, Carlos Bacas, uh, Adam Shirkus, uh, Sylvia, who I think works with you, and everybody I deal with uh, is uh, just strikes me as being very high quality, very responsive, uh, very high quality people. And, you know, that's, that's an intangible uh, uh, factor, but uh, to me, that means a lot that, that these, these people you can just sense care about the company and um, and do a great job. So, um, you know, on behalf of my viewers and everybody who joined us today, uh, Jorge, you know, you shared a great deal of information with us, your view of the overall precious metals market, but I think gave us a good uh, inside glimpse of, of where Fortuna has been and where they're heading. Uh, is there anything else that I that I forgot to ask you about that you want to mention? I know the second quarter earnings are coming up. Uh, any, uh, I'm, any uh, anything I forgot to, to bring up? No, no. Uh, I think we touched on the main things, and and uh, I think we all look with a lot of anticipation to to what's coming in the near future. Uh, you know, and Fortuna because what we have in the pipeline, yes. and uh, 
you know, with what's happening with the macro economics and, and, and the perspective for the underlying commodities that we mine, silver and gold, right? Yeah. Uh, I think we are all looking with a lot of anticipation to what uh, is unfolding there, no? Yeah, that's outstanding. We'll look forward to hearing from you more in the future. I almost forgot if I could ask you one small favor. I have a, a gentleman who helps me a lot with the channel. He's very smart. He's very analytical and he really likes you. And he must have asked me 10 times to make sure that I tell you that Coin Shop Chris says hello to Carlos and he, he gives you a big thumbs up. <laughs> I'll let him know. Thank you for that. Yes, yes. Well, Carlo, or, I'm sorry, Jorge, I'm, I apologize. Thanks for your time, okay? And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again in the future. Absolutely.